Sup, Holmes? Beware, your host, Jonathan Holmes. Thank you, Sinistar, for the, the lovely introduction. And uh, to, I'm going to try to do one, too. Steve Swink, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. How are you? Great. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Your, no your show is my favoritist of the interview type game build. No. Oh, see, mm, I appreciate the compliment, but now I feel these lofty expectations to do a thing. <laughs> well, and you were the one earlier who was like, the, the next big name in gaming, Steve Swink. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be. I had to pay that forward. It's, like, uh, it's true, I'm though. Everyone who talks Steve about you is like, oh, that smart guy Steve Swink is going to be on it? Oh, he's making a game that people like. Yeah. And uh, you showed it off at E3 last year. It was called Scale. It was at the Indie Booth. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, exciting. We will talk about that soon. But before we do, tell us uh, how you got into this thing. You've made some video games. True. You haven't gone big console publisher, all that stuff as of yet, have you? Well, I, I did work on one of the Tony Hawk games, so I guess that kind of counts. Oh, I didn't know that. Which Tony Hawk game? The Tony Hawk Underground, so where things kind of started to go wrong. <laughs> what, what did you do on uh, Tony I was Hawk? A, I was a designer. I made the first level, most of the first level, or you know, a bit more than half of the first level. Did a bunch of goal scripting, did a bunch of uh, prototyping of internal mechanics and systems and scripting languages and messing around with AI skaters and all that sort of thing. Oh, sounds pretty intense. Was that that wasn't your first uh, job in the industry then? I no, know. yeah. I mean, my, I'm I'm fond of telling this story because it's kind of like the typical crush your dreams, get out of school, all you want to do is make video games kind of story. Can but I, I worked at this company called Tremor. That was we were making this really actually pretty cool like Xbox game called uh, ironically the Unseen. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. And it was in fact never seen, so that turned out to be a fairly appropriate title. What was the unseen about? So it was basically like it would have been similar to God of War. It had sort of RPG elements, but it was a brawler with a lot of fighting game kind of combo system, kind of cool stuff. And the, and it was really fun because for me, because the team that I was working with was basically the team that made StarCraft, like the design team. That's so awesome. Like, so like James Finney, Jeffrey Vaughn, Robert Jordovich, all those guys. Um, so I, I got my ass kicked like a hundred rounds in a row at Samurai Showdown 4 by the lead designer of StarCraft, like every night for two years. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> How old were you then? Uh, that was, I was 20 when I got that job, and then I turned 21 while working at a game studio, which turns out to be a very hungover idea. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like 20 years old, not even old enough to vote, and you're hanging out with the StarCraft guy. Is that true? Making... I think you voted 18. Oh, you're right. Old enough to drink. I mix right. those two up sometimes. Uh, and then you, the unseen never got seen. Why? What happened to that game? Well, I don't really know. I mean, I just like I was pretty low on the totem pole at that point. So I, I just showed up one day, and I was the first one there. And I was trying to open the door, and my key didn't work anymore. And I was like hideously confused by that. I was like, I don't know what. And then the door opened from behind, and it was the CFO, the chief financial officer of the company. And she was like, Yeah, there's no money. You know, get your stuff, go home. And they had an armed security guard with a gun who, who like walked us to our desks and made sure we didn't steal shit. But then the the crazy Bulgarian programmers who used to like race their sports cars through Topanga Canyon, they like razzle dazzled this the security guard and like stole a dev kit. <laughs> like one of them distracted it, and then they ran out the back with the dev kit. But anyway, yeah, that was my first experience in the game industry. So at ten in the morning, we we're like drinking beer and throwing a football around in the parking lot outside the game studio because we didn't have anywhere to go. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> just... That is incredible. And, and you, uh, even though you're still connected to the industry, I'm sure you still know those guys. You haven't heard anything about whatever happened to Unseen or if it could ever well, we see sort of the light of day? Loaded around for a month or two thinking maybe some other studio would pick us up or whatever, but I think there was still too much work left to be done on the game mm -hmm. in order for anyone to care about it enough to pick it up or whatever. It would have oh. been really thinking because uh, just on their own with nothing to a game other than fighting game mechanics, they sell millions. So to ingest those kind of mechanics into a more um, appealing or more uh, mainstream genre could make everybody happy, but it's so rarely done. You so rarely see a uh, fighting game uh, engine in a standard RPG or action game or whatever, and that's always kind of puzzled me. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think it's just because making games is really, really hard. 
Yeah, and that's something you've <laughs> talked a lot about, and it's something that not a lot of people uh, focus on, but uh, you've done some really interesting talks about how experimental games are really hard. And yeah, a lot of right. people often say, oh, well, you know, you, you come up with a, a, a gimmick and then you just write off that gimmick, and that's not as hard as, like, making the next big FPS or something, but but yeah. uh, your talks have been really compelling to, to show people how the more interesting your gimmick is, oftentimes the easier it is to break and to, to make your, your gimmick work or your mechanic work uh, in a way that's uh, fair can be really hard. And that's a, a big thing in, in scale. So let's talk about scale. Let's tell sure, them about yeah, it. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so for whatever reason, my brain wants to give me these ideas that are really interesting to people. And they, they, they're easy as conceptual hooks, but they they involve really complex, difficult technical problems. <laughs> and so like, I have this regrettable instinct for stuff that gets people really excited, and then now I have to make this game that's extremely difficult to make. And like I've tried to make games that are much less ambitious as far as the experimental mechanic kind of stuff goes, and I just find I can't muster the enthusiasm to keep going on them because it, they're just not interesting to me. Like I have to make these games that are interesting to the to the things that I want to experience in games, and so it's like, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so scale is basically asking the question: What would happen if in in a game world you could scale stuff up and down as much as you want? And there have been some sort of tepid, you know, dip your toes in the water type explorations, like in Mario 64. There was like the big small world where you would go through the pipe and you'd become small or big and go back and forth and so on. Um, but there hadn't been a game where you could just manipulate the scale of objects freely. And so I wanted to know why that was. So I cooked up a quick prototype. And it turns out it's one of those things that's really easy to prototype quickly, but really hard to make it like actually work and not explode all the time. Because every physics engine ever written comes with the most basic assumption that you won't be doing that. <laughs> you're, not, you're just going to, the size of objects, those are going to be the same all the time, right? Like, it's a very particular type of problem that I'm trying to solve. So it's all sorts of things like this object is getting scaled and it mushes up against this other object and then that object freaks out and explodes and gets launched to Jupiter. <laughs> what, are you, uh, what are you programming it in? So it's being done in Unity right now. Mm -hmm. I love Which is Unity. a great language, so people tell me a great program to use. But yeah. uh, from what I've seen... It was immediately playable. How long had you been working on it before E3, actually? Um, I did a prototype for it at a game jam like two years ago or something. And it was a very promising prototype, but it was very broken. And then I just was working on Shadow Physics at that time, so there was like another year of that. And then I spent the last year working at ASU on a series of educational games that are meant to replace uh, textbooks, particular textbooks. So we're we're on we're on this whole other level now where we're not trying to make organ trail or fraction munchers where we're trying to like really take the subject matter and and write a text that is has integrity to that subject matter and is really deep and complex but we're you know we're kind of trying to look at what would be good to make a game into as opposed to having a bunch of kids sitting in a classroom facing forward listening to a teacher like what would be way better as a game and so we're trying to make these games that replace a textbook which is really what we need because of the state of American schools is just a nightmare right now and people are you know trying to make stuff that they can get into the classrooms but but they're the teachers are so full up with stuff that they have to teach because it's going to be on the test and they get fired if the if their students don't pass the test and the school loses its funding if their students don't pass the test thanks to George Bush good job no child left behind it kind of looks like they're leaving some children behind I don't know uh, anyway yeah so so yeah, a couple of years I've been working on that, um, but but it's really just been like a spare time project, and I, I I just feel like it's it's like this sort of sleeping beast, and I just occasionally poke it with a stick, and it's like, Rrr. but whenever I do, people get really excited about it. Like the amount of excitement that is caused in people versus the amount of work that I've put in has been an extremely favorable ratio. Definitely the most favorable of any game I've worked on. Um, so it's not it's not like braid. I, I think John famously described the development of braid as like walking through a field of gold nuggets and just like choosing which ones to pick up and which ones to throw away. I'm like, ah, shut up, John. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But it, it's it, definitely it's... it feels like a lot better than uh, shadow physics, where where 
I just felt like every level that I build, it took me four or five hours to build, and the hit ratio between ideas that I had and things that would turn out to be cool and interesting, it, I was just like wringing any enjoyable gameplay out of it was just this unbelievably painful process. And so, yeah, it was really interesting because it, it looks so cool, right? But but setting up a level for Shadow Physics was just a nightmare. It took forever to just to get everything feeling good and tuned right in the positioning of objects, and it just... It just, yeah. I mean, I could talk about that at length. I talked about it a little bit in that that talk at Indicate about just why it was so hard to make that game. Yeah, it would be really uh, interesting for people to know and also kind of a um, cautionary tale for people. The, for those who are listening or watching or don't know, Shadow Physics was a really interesting-looking game that you were working on with a team. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just you. No, uh, so our team was called Enemy Airship. It was myself, um, R.C. Torres... Uh, rctorres.net, if you want to check out his artwork. Uh, Scott Anderson, who uh, is working at a studio in San Francisco right now, the name of which I can never remember, but they're making Call of Duty something or other. Oh, okay. And um, and Justin Messner and uh, Alex Burley, who both work at ASU. I, I sort of formed a team at ASU to make these these games under the Atlantis remix was the was the brand of the games, I guess. For the the center of ga- center for games and impact at ASU and we Atlantis Remix was where all these games sort of fit under this brand. Um, yeah, so it was cool. It was a cool team. It just the game that we were trying to make was a nightmare. Like most of the time when you make a game, shadows, you know, like detailed shadows are kind of like an after effect. You know, it like makes the game look cooler and it grounds the buildings and objects and characters so they feel you know like they're not just floating in space and it gives you you know. It has a lot of benefits, but you usually do that at the end because it requires a lot of complex code and you're talking to the GPU and doing all that stuff. So Scott actually wrote a 2D collision engine that functioned on a GPU. So it would like push the shadows to the shadow buffer and then it would use the extra like render cycles to pull back. I don't really understand how it works particularly well, but it was just totally bananas thing. And that was the first piece of technology that had to be written for anything to work at all. And so it was kind of just like this crazy monumental thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a game for, for people who don't know. It's a puzzle platformer, objects in the field. You can adjust the, the lighting, and uh, the lighting creates a shadow, and your character is a shadow, and they only react uh, in terms of collision and physics with the other shadow objects. Yeah. And you traverse the, the field. They actually, there's a Wii game with the same idea, but it wasn't as detailed. I, I'm guessing they weren't as ambitious. Lost um, in Shadow? Yeah, I don't know if you ever played it. Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, yeah. So an interesting distinction between Shadow Physics and Lost in Shadow, and there's actually two people who are working on Shadow games right now. There's one called Contrast, and I forget the, the, the name of the other one. But the, the big distinction between Lost in Shadow and Shadow Physics is orthographic projection. So it was really important to me that it not be orthographic projection, meaning that uh, the light actually has a cone that comes out, and so like the shadows will be. It, uh, what's a good way to describe orthographic projection? It's it's like if you just took a box and just like drew a box over a shadow projection, it would be really kind of flat. Whereas so that's sort of like an orthographic projection, and it saves you a lot of headaches because it's a lot easier to predict where things are and where they're going to be if the shadow changes. Whereas the shadow casting that we had was like real, actual, legitimate shadow casting, which is quite a bit more expensive computationally. But it has a lot of neat results that you don't get with orthographic, like um, you know, like moving a box closer and further away from the light really scales it up and down the shadow. And we had all this crazy code that would detect how big the box was relative to the player character. So you could only push things if they got small, so you had to like find a different shadow on a different wall of the same object with multiple lights and like push it to make it smaller so you could push it in this other direction and stuff like that. It was a lot of really interesting stuff, but it just was just like wringing blood out of stone to, <laughs> to yeah. get it to work at all. I'd imagine that there must have been such a, a difficult internal push and pull where you would discover all these things in your engine and get really excited about how you can play with this world you created and share it with people, but then actually sculpting it and, and really refining it into something that you were happy with must have been so hard. And then it died? Is that what happened? Well, uh, Indie Fun came to us and they were like, okay, you guys have been working on this for a couple of years now and we see it heading towards being a cool game, but we see it taking like another three years and we were like, yeah, fair enough. 
And they were like, yeah, we can't fund it for another three years. And we're like, okay. And then at that point, I was like having all kinds of medical problems. Like I was having like terrible ulcers and like, oh, it was bad. It was, yeah, because I was so stressed out. Man, if you've never run a company before, it is a nightmare. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, people, you know, people think they want to be in charge, but they don't really realize what that means. It's, it's really a fascinating experience to be in charge of writing paychecks and for people to be relying on you to write those paychecks, to pay their rent, to pay for their wife's health care, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, you know, like every little decision you just stress out about, like I understand how people start to really freak out and want people to be at work all day, every day, because because you just you can like see the dollars in the bank account ticking down and you're just like, oh God, oh God, oh God, right? And so I was just so stressed out and like it wasn't coming together and, and I just kind of had to make the call like I am not comfortable putting this out on the trajectory it's on and I'm not comfortable putting my name on it and I, I don't think that it's worth it because I don't think that the game return for time and energy invested is positive enough. Mm -hmm for us to be able to, to keep making this game. And so it was kind of one of those, you know, all right, I guess I'm an adult now kind of moments. Like, yeah, I got to make this. I got to eh, eh, smother that baby. <laughs> <laughs> that is, ah, oh, it is not, people think, oh, video games, fun, uh, programming, programming itself is like a video game. Oh, you get in there and uh, make some discoveries and, oh, you're just at a computer all day, guys. But it's, it's life or death stuff for you and your employees, and you could end up um, ruining everyone's real life as opposed to their video game. Well, I mean, I think also, you know, that's a, that's a little too fatalistic, and I also think we all live in such a ludicrously privileged society that we have all these safety nets that, that you know, we, I think it's overstating it to say that it's life or death because... Mm. You know, we're young, we don't have kids, we start a company, it fails, we, you know, I have, you know, a couple of $30,000 worth of debt that I need to pay off, right? Like, that's not a huge deal. Like, it sucks, but I'm not starving, I'm not in a hovel, you know, it's it's really, you know, if worse comes to worse, I could move back in with my parents or something, you know, like, I own a house, I, I would have to sell it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But, but, I mean, I, you know, it definitely sucks, and it definitely, you know, you stress out about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would you know, imagine it. Yeah, and I mean, we have a lot bigger problems in the world than, than video games, right? Like, we need to figure out how to stop destroying the planet so that we can all continue to live here and stuff. That would be pretty good, I think. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, the world's okay. <laughs> it's, it's all right. <laughs> I would, uh, maybe I was over-empathizing, but I was just putting myself in your shoes as much as I could and thinking about, like, I can screw up for me all day. Like, yeah. sub homes can be all screwed up and people can say it's the worst show ever and only Sinistar suffers for it, and he's kind of a jerk, so it doesn't yeah. really matter. But you, you had to define yourself by how well you were not only doing for yourself, but how you, well you were doing for others, and also for everyone who played your game. Yeah. And that would make me feel pretty worried, yes. frankly. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and I certainly had a good, proper freak out about it, right? You know, I just was so stressed out, because... because it always felt like it was all on me, you know, and, and I feel like we have a tendency, especially in our culture, to be a little bit overly self-important. I have this wonderful friend who I'll tell you about in a minute who, who helps me break out of that, but um, at that time, it just felt like the world was falling apart, and if I could just if I could just get this next mechanic or this next thing that will really make the game, or if I could just tune the feel of the game a little bit better, all of a sudden it would all come together and everything would work perfectly, which is just such a deluded state of mind. And, you know, you got to realize that we're making video games here. It's an entertainment medium. People who play it, they have an unbelievable amount of privilege. They have disposable income. They, they live in the most wealthy societies in the world. You know, it's not, it's not curing cancer at the best of times. But um, I certainly, you know, it was very real to me, and I was having a really rough time with it. And, you know, I, I really got myself all wound up, and, my, you know, I was having, like, the really bad health problems. And, I, you know, I, I basically like, took a month off doing anything, and I was... I just had to reset and say, you know what, it's this is not worth this. And so that's kind of my attitude now. It's like, I'm going to work on scale for, you know, another year or so until it starts to feel like it's pretty cool, and then I'm, you know, just going to release it <laughs> and not it's worry a, too much about it. It's, uh, you talk about perspective a lot already. It's interesting as I'm getting to know you. You can take a, a broad general perspective and think, it's just video games. There's There's people with bigger problems, but you also 
sounds like you, you psychologically have the capacity to focus on real intense minutia of what you're working about. And then, weirdly enough, you end up making a video game about blowing things up really big or shrinking <laughs> yeah. something down and looking at it in a, in a broader field. Uh, fun. It's like your brain. You made your brain the game. It's oh, my game. God. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> we should talk more about it and the challenges mm. you're, you're hitting with it because I've watched a bunch of videos of it on the Internet. Everyone who was playing it was making ooh and like aga, gaga sounds. So and happy. Was, yeah, that was making uh, me really happy. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was. I bet it was because you didn't, uh, you'd shown it before at the Game Jam, you said it was made? Yeah, I showed it at a Game Jam and I, you know, I, I, I was blown away by the response at E3, honestly. I mean, I, I didn't think people would be as excited about it as they were, so that was really nice. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd imagine. Um, do you like the Katamari games at all? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember uh, John and Chris, like, introducing the Katamari to the world at GDC, right? That was kind of experimental gameplay workshop. That talk was when Katamari sort of premiered, and the response that, from the crowd is what convinced them to release Katamari in the, in the wider market as opposed to just in Japan. I didn't know that, huh? Yeah. Uh, and, and what do you attribute that to when you look at that game? Why do you think it clicks with people? It's just so joyful. Like, it's just such a pure distillation of Kaida. Like, he's just a silly, amazing man. And, yeah. I mean, <laughs> have you ever, like, interviewed him or talked to him at no, all? No, I wish. I'm so envious. I, uh, I'm freaking, about his new, freaking out about his new game, uh... Uh, something Tenya Teens? Tenya Wanya Teens, yeah. Tenya Wanya Teens, yeah. Uh, freaking out. And then he's making a game with uh, Adam Saltzman now. Yeah, I, I, Alphabet. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God damn it. Hopefully yeah. I'll meet him someday. But yeah. uh, but I always uh, took to Katamari that whether people... Sure, it's, it's incredibly just fun to be there, but you put your life in perspective when you play it. And it's very serious... Like, the, the craft of it is very serious, but the tone is very silly. And to me, that's uh, kind of a wonderful way to make light of these things we think are so important. I mean, in the game, you're, you're running over people and uh, presumably ending their life forever, but it's all taken for... Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's just another star in the sky, and it doesn't necessarily uh, have to have that gravity to it. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm overanalyzing Katamari. But then no, I saw no. Scale and wondered what you might be taking from Katamari, if anything, in your uh, thinking behind what well, you're doing now. I think I, I would love to have some of that sense of joy, but simultaneously injecting some some deeper meaning. You know, I, I, I think that there are a lot of people who are kind of like, well, it's just video games, and I know I just said that a minute ago, but a lot of people say, use that as a justification for not attempting to say anything deeper than... It's a fun game with their games, and I, you know, I think that there's really room for more than that, right? Like I think, and it doesn't have to be, you know, really lugubrious, you know, labored, metaphorical, blah blah blah. Like it can just be fun and joyful and stuff like that. So I mean, I, what I really love, because so okay, so I play Katamari Damacy, and and it kind of the feeling I get from playing it sort of reminds me of like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, or you know, some of those Gondry films and stuff like that. And so I'd really love to inject some of that into my game. And that's, that's a reasonable um, parallel as well because the, the scale gun as an object, I want to put it in the world and then treat it like a sort of a hard sci-fi kind of thing. You know, really good sci-fi writers, they'll take a fantastical premise like a machine that can erase your memories of a particular person or a particular thing. And then they explore what that would do to people and what that would mean in a really intricate and delightful way. And so... That's kind of where I'm heading, because right now it's very sparse and video gamey, the world. Like, it's basically get through the level, to solve the puzzle, figure out the thing. And one of the things that I've noticed when people are playing it is they just love to play around with it. Like, they just get into the game, and the first thing they do is they want to make a tree that's that's as big as the stars. You know, like, it <laughs> goes up and up and up. And, like, I should just make that part of the game, because that's what people want to do, and so you know, I should put like a little castle in the sky up there that you can get to, and there's like a star in it or something. Like, I feel like it's it's part of part of the development of the game on me as a creator should be to look at what is compelling about the game and not overanalyze it and find ways to make the players able to do what they want to do with the system. Huh. 
sort of really tailor make it so their play instincts get fed and not so much about what your kind of top down ideas are for what they should do. Yeah, I mean that was I think that was a lesson I learned from shadow physics is like you just can't as a designer control stuff that much and I think that you can cause yourself a lot of problems by trying to control stuff that much and it's just yeah, I don't know. You got to let it go kind of thing and that's where I think a lot of really beautiful things come from and I feel like Katamari is like all that, you know, it's like he would have a silly idea and you just put it in the game and now it's just part of the game and it's funny and, and it's not they're not safe silly ideas. It's not you know, you can run over people and they scream, and, but then they do like a funny animation and it's very iconic. And it's so much better than if they're, they like ragdolled and were realistic looking or something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Just the art direction of that game was incredibly brave, I thought, to kind of not only reject realism, but also to reject any sort of attempts at nostalgia either. I don't yeah. think anyone is nostalgic for just block world, but it was. To me, the, the perfect art direction for expressing the idea of big things, small things, we're all made out of the same stuff. And we're all kind of... Uh, one of the underlying messages for the game to me is that um, no matter how big or small something is, it's really uh, the same. And the, that's all just in our head that there's really a, a difference. Um, I, often, I, I wonder if Kaede Takahashi watched, like, Cosmos. Like, we're all star stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's where he uh, but oh, so we're talking a little bit about your influences, but I totally skipped the part of the show where I ask you mm. what got you into wanting to make video games. What are the games you grew up thinking were great? If those are games you still think are so great now, so let's do the autobiographical. Part. Okay, How sure. did you yeah. Start doing this thing. Um, I think I wanted to make video games starting when I was six. My dad brought home a Commodore sixty four. And I was just completely captivated by it. And uh, in particular, I remember this game called Sea Route to India. So it wasn't yes. Frogger. It wasn't Frogger, and it wasn't you know whatever else people were playing. It was. It's kind of a weird like Oregon Trail kind of thing, where you're you're trying to get a ship around the Horn of Africa to India from Europe, so you can trade with India. So this was something that people were trying to figure out a lot in like the you know 1600s, 1700s, whatever, and so on. Um, and so, you, you, yeah, you would travel around, and then you'd be, like, attacked by pirates as a random event, and then you'd have to, like, hunt. So you'd you have this little mini game where your boat's on the top, and there are whales, and you have to, like, shoot them with a harpoon with the correct timing. They'd flip upside down and flip to the top and stuff like that. I, I just thought this was the most wonderful thing in the world when I was six years old. Sea route to India? Yeah. And, That's and amazing. I, I hadn't been able to find a ROM of it, and I actually mentioned it on another podcast a couple of weeks ago, and somebody found a ROM and, like, pasted it to me, so I still need to bust that out and see if it was this amazing as I thought. I'm guessing it probably doesn't hold up that well, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, you never so, know. I really make games. Yeah, I don't know, I, and I was just really into that, and I like the way that games bring together all these different media. You know, it's music, it's... it's artwork, it's gameplay, and then you sort of have to sew it all together with programming and so on. So, yeah, I don't know, I, I made some games when I was like in fifth grade and stuff like that. And that was just, you know, I kind of fell out of it a little bit. I really wish I had a mentor who encouraged me to keep programming and stuff like that, because I sort of just kind of drifted a bit in high school, and I got to the end of high school and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I get, you know, I'm going to go to college, right? And so I just found this college that was right down the road that was the only fully accredited college in the U.S. at that time, which was 1998, that had a major in game design. And I was like, sweet, cool, Cogsville College, here we go, we're going to do this, yeah. So I don't know, I mean, I've always been sort of, uh, you know, broad rather than deep, like I really dig uh, literature and, you know, movies, like crazy ass movies that, that are really weird, like I love old Kurosawa films and I love, uh, you know, David Lynch and like weird filmmaking that, that's really off. Like Primer is one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Timer? Primer. Primer. No, I've yeah. heard about it. But yeah, Shane Proof. It. It's, it's probably the best uh, time travel movie ever made. Huh. It's just I was just made... thinking about Time Bandits a couple of days ago <laughs> because it was the only thing that was as weird as Zach McCracken, which was a Commodore 64 game. I don't know. If right, okay, yeah, it. totally, yeah. Because yeah. LucasArts just closed. Yeah. Oh, so sad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I really felt a, a sinking when that happened. That was a feel-bad moment. Except, I mean, but they hadn't really been making super interesting stuff for a long time. It was basically just back to making Star Wars stuff, right? 
Pretty much, but I had this weird, ludicrous hope, I guess, that Lucas had been running scared and was feeling like, oh, I don't really know if I've got it anymore. I don't know if I can lead a, a company anymore. Um, and that's why his games were so safe, because it was kind of a lack of bravery. Because he gets a lot... People hate him now. He's got to be feeling that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, oh, he'll sell it to Disney, and they'll have all this creative confidence, and they'll back them up, and they'll say, hey, go wild, come up with new ideas. This is Disney. We're Imagineers. Yay, fun. And then no, close. No, no, no. Really Disney, that. Disney is not a company about innovation and Imagineering anymore. Disney is a company about making as much money as possible. Well, that stinks. Because they does. own everything now. They own that. They own Marvel. They own freaking Muppets. They own Pixar, which is really oh. sad, since now we have, like, Infinite Cars sequels, and they're, like, sequeling Monsters, Inc., and they're sequeling Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo, yeah. Yeah, you're and right. I have it on, on uh, a certain account that there are actually two or three unique properties being made by, like, the core old-school Pixar team. So there are actually, like, some good, cool-looking things on the horizon at Pixar, but... In the meantime, it's, you know, planes, the world above cars, <laughs> anthropomorphic F-16s blowing up children, I guess. I don't know. I had no idea. Oh, God, thank God. <laughs> Some people are still making things that are good, because now I feel mildly depressed. Sorry, uh, what are some of the other games that got you into to liking games? And tell um, me about this lapse you had where you weren't as into it. Uh, was that because you lost interest in video games as well, or was that because... I think it was mostly just, just, you know, getting beat down by high school and, like, being a high school student. I think we all kind of went through that tough time when it was just like, what? what? No! Ah! What the hell? <laughs> yeah, we absolutely did. But was there ever a time where you... Because you started at 6 with... Uh, Sea Passage to India? Was yeah, that Sea Route to India. Sea Route to India. And I, I played like Rastan and stuff, but it never held my interest as much as the kind of weird simulation-y kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so then, yeah, I don't know. I, I loved Sim Ant, and I actually had an opportunity to talk to Will Wright, and I was telling him about how uh, I played Sim Ant, and like the first game that I really seriously designed was based on Sim Ant. It was called Sim B. And I went and to the library and I got a stack of 12 books about bees and I read about bees for like a month and I got like hexagonal graph paper and I drew out this whole crazy design of like the UI of Sim B and how it all work and fit together. That's amazing. And I was and so I, excited about it. And he was like, hey, man, that's great. That's totally what I would have wanted to have happen. <laughs> huh. It's, it's weird because one of the other people we had on the show not that long ago, Jasper Byrne, I just discovered he made a game called... Uh, I think it's called Everything You Need to Know About Bees. Oh, really? Yeah, you should. Uh, I'll send you a link to it after the show. Sure. Um, and he's also just kind of a hard-thinking gentleman mm -hmm. who doesn't Jasper want is awesome. to. Yeah, he's a he's a great guy. You've probably met him. Mm -hmm. Seems like you know a lot of people in the uh, in the big and small aspects of the industry. Yeah, I've just been around for a long time. Like I went to the very first IGF awards in 1999. When it was not a big celebration, it was in the corridor. It was like the whole, the whole the, the, like a guy with a megaphone stood on a soapbox and was like, "Uh, okay, we're gonna give out the awards now." And then he just like walked around and pinned it on the the little kiosks which were in the corridor of the San Jose Convention Center. <laughs> That's incredible. So it's, uh, I want to know more about your brain and how you ended up having this brain that so tightly latched onto this whole industry for, for better or worse. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of people after Unseen would just be like, all right, I'm, I'm going to Hollywood, I guess. I'm going to do special effects on the, the next Jurassic Park or something. But it seems like there's something about this industry that's really hooked you into it. Telling, uh, yeah. I mean, so after Unseen, that's when I got a job as a game designer working on Tony Hawk. And I was, I was thinking, yes, okay, this game for sure will ship. They've made four of these games in the last four years. Like... For sure, this is not the studio is not going to melt down before this game comes out. So that was cool and stuff. Um, but they kind of, yeah, I don't know. It was pretty, it was pretty eye opening because it was very workaday kind of. Lots of people with families, and they, you know, they got to work and they did their work, and then they went home, and there wasn't a lot of pride in it. And I, I did, I had a lot of trouble fitting in because I always would point things out when things were shitty that we were putting into the game, and like that's not. You know, it's not a popular opinion in a junior designer or whatever. Um, yeah, so I just kind of felt like like I was grasping at this idea of, of making video games that didn't exist. And so, 
you know, I finished my work there and I was just like physically and emotionally crushed and I was like all fat and I had like long hair and like a scraggly beard and my clothes were all torn up and I was just like a wreck. And, and yeah, I mean, I tell the story all the time, I guess I'll tell it again, but, but so I, I went down to Best Buy because it was my dream to make a video game and to so watch somebody buy it. So I like went down to the Best Buy and I stood by the rack of the freshly opened rack of Tony Hawk Underground games and I waited for someone to buy it and like these skater kids came in and they were like fighting over a chocolate ice cream cone and they were all like shitty and they were just like, eh, what game should we buy? Eh, Tony Hawk. I was like, no, that game sucks. And I was just like, oh god, oh no, what am I doing with my life? Um, and that was, geez, Tony Hawk Underground, that was 2003. What, 2000, 2003, wow, 10 years ago. Yep. So then, you... so my buddies were forming Flashbang Studios in Arizona at that time, a bunch of friends of mine that I, I went to college with, uh, Matthew Wagner, Ben Reese, those guys are making uh, Aztecs. You should interview them, they're, they're hilarious and great. Um, Sounds fun. It's, it's a black and white Aztec-themed brawler roguelike. What? Yes, it's awesome. Yeah, you should check it out. And Ben ha maintains a wonderful blog about brawlers and fighting game mechanics on uh, AztecsGame.com, I believe. Yeah, awesome. It's, yeah, I would love to. It never ends. Like I always think, because this show is booked out until I think July now. Yeah. And I've like asked everyone I've ever heard of that I I really think is interesting to be on the show, and then I find out about like ten more guys. This this industry is <laughs> it's huge. It's, it's well, it's getting crazy, man. Like, I mean, I remember going to GDC and John and Chris are up there, and they're like, "Hey, we invented this crazy thing. It's called Game Jam." We we you know we did a game jam. We made games in a weekend, and everybody's like, "What?" <laughs> right? And and they like showed all the games that they made, and they were amazing. And the first year they did it, they hacked together like uh, Atman Binstock and Casey Muratori like hacked together this sprite engine that would render a million sprites, and they just turned everybody loose on that. Let's like make a game out of a million sprites. And so there was like a crazy forest fire game, and then there was a game where you played as like the Doom Marine. And you, a million enemies were coming over the hills at you, and you like it slowly zoomed out, and like all this crazy stuff. This game where you had one bullet, and you were just walking through an endless field of people, and you had to find the one person that you're supposed to assassinate in this giant world with like echolocation. It was crazy. It was really neat. When did all that happen? How did I miss that? That was like 2004, I think. The first, ex the first uh, experimental gameplay sessions. Amazing. Oh, but, but back then, I mean, back then it was basically you're in the mainstream industry or you're making casual games. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And, and now it's just, like, unbelievable how many people are making stuff that's just amazing. And it kind of feels like everybody in the mainstream industry wants to be indie now. Like, Journey won all the awards at the Game Developer's Choice Award, which is supposedly voted for by people from the industry. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And mm -hmm. Walk, uh, Walking Dead won a bunch of the awards at the um, the TV show, the video game awards, and Journey won a bunch there. And it, it's it's weird to see the the money people being hungry for. It, it reminds me of '70s a little bit, like how mm -hmm. punk rock in New York City was really big in the '70s, and all of a sudden by the '80s, um, Poison had come out, and there were. I feel like a lot of hair metal is happening to uh, the, the AAA industry right now where they're like, we want this like gritty, dirty, real thing that people did even if they didn't have any money or necessarily a ton of uh, practice or skill, but there <laughs> are these people making stuff because they're so passionate about it. We want to buy that passion and get rich off of it. And uh, I'm trying to decide whether I think that's good or not, uh, the way that Sony and Nintendo... Uh, that's who I'm hearing the most from right now are, mm -hmm. are going after the indies hard, but also kind of shaping them along the way to try to make them fit into the mold they think will uh, will get them the most money. Um, have you? Uh, am I just, is this all this in my head, or have you seen any of this stuff? Have no, yeah, I mean, I, I think that maybe you're overstating the influence that Sony and Nintendo have over the developers because they're both, like, pretty cool about stuff. So they're basically like, yeah, man, make what you want. We'll put it out there. That they're that's like to, that's, that's good news, but it's hard to it's hard to imagine uh, that they will stay that way. Maybe that I'm might pessimistic, be true. but I mean, I, I think I, I think the amount of money that's being made off of these games is so infinitesimal relative to you know your your multi-billion-dollar Call of Duty, what and whatnot. 
um, that it's still like a small part of the company that doesn't that nobody really cares that much about. Like it's profitable, but it's like a couple million dollars profitable. It's not. They don't take it very seriously. I think the right. way it's, they take the you know release of the PS4, which is why I felt like John Blow showing up at that press conference was like a total mind melt. At the PS4 press conference, I was like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> like, the, like the cat in the Spidey Cat commercial, like my eyes got all CG big and I was watching that. I was like, what is Yeah, I was just talking to him on this show months before, just a live, you know, a live stream webcam. You know, I don't know how many people watch this show, but it's not as many people as watching the Sony yeah. press conference. And then he shows up in these nice clothes and is like <laughs> talking about how it's going to be a timed exclusive on the PS4. It was... It was mind blowing to me, and and simultaneously exciting and and worrisome, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of really weird things happening. I think the success of something like Antichamber sitting at number one on Steam for a couple of weeks, and the success of FTL and and like Kerbal Space Program and all these games, I think it shows that people are really starting to get taste, which was one of the big things that we were so worried about in like the mid aughts, if I could say that. Mm. Um, <laughs> like I've never said that non-ironically before, but anyway, we were so it was like you know yeah we we want to have games that are not all sequels and we want to make these crazy things that we want to make and we want to have an audience for them and the audience just doesn't exist and it's because people just don't have taste and they don't know that they want these different experiences they just think they just want to keep playing the same game but with better graphics and so on and it turns out now that's totally not the case like people are totally getting more sophisticated in their taste about what they're interested in and stuff, and it's really cool and interesting. But, it, I mean, it still all comes back to this thing that nobody has any idea how to make a game. Like, there's no such thing as a formula for making a good game. And, I don't know, I think it's just so terrifying for people that once they have a game that somehow magically comes together, like Assassin's Creed or whatever, and it's, it's such, like, a swing for the fences, but, you know, basically costs a lot of money to make and could totally flop kind of thing... They're like, okay, 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 sweet. Okay, we got this thing. All right, now we're going to make like 50 of them. Right? And they sort of poison the well. And, and I don't know. I feel like as indies, we, we are repulsed by that. And we, we really make stuff. And when it magically succeeds, we're willing to fess up to the fact that, like, yeah, right place, right time. You know, I'm sure I had something to do with it because I made the game. But at, at the same time, yeah. You know, I don't have any illusions about it, and I, I'm not going to become risk adverse because of that. I'm not going to like make Braid Two or World of Goo Two or whatever. Like, I'm going to make some other crazy ass thing because that's what I need to do to feel good about myself and have integrity as an artist or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people don't think about that sort of thing. It's like whatever, you know. They, uh, I don't know. I get in arguments. One really sad argument I got in with kind of a hope high profile guy. I won't name him. I could probably guess. But we were talking about whether video games were a waste of time. And he was like, yeah, they're a waste of time, but I love them, and I dedicate my life to them. But I know I should be working or doing something else. And I was like, how can you know? They're so good sometimes. Have you played Cart Life or Dysphoria or right. Depression Quest? And he was like, mm, nah. <laughs> oh, this guy. But they're still, I feel like... We're coming out of this uh, time where, for whatever reason, there's this kind of shame for some people about saying the thinking it's okay to to say video games are important. People are afraid of saying, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound pretentious or I'm gonna sound like I'm making this all about me." But I I don't know why uh, I don't know why people have to be so worried about looking pretentious. Can't we just yeah. say that we think we're doing something we think is actually good? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that there are video games out there that can really reshape the world. I mean, I think games are reshaping the world. Um, okay, rant incoming. But anyway, I this is one of the reasons why I spent a year and a half working on these educational games and why I spent so much time thinking about how to give those the systems in those games integrity because I think that public education, especially in this country, is totally failing the youth of America, and consequently it's failing us who are supposed to be preparing these people to kind of fix all these problems that we've left them with the environment and so on because people just don't have a primer for systems thinking. They get into this mode where they think that they're owed things because they showed up to work every day, you know, and it, it's not about excellence anymore and it's not about 
how to interact with complex systems, and even the first decision that you make when you get out of high school, choosing a college, right? I use this example in a talk I gave at PAX East a couple of weeks ago about, about these educational programs that I've been working on. Um, you, you are totally unprepared by your education for the complexity of the system which leads you to go to a particular college. So there's US News does this publication, the top college ranking, whatever, and, it, and you look at that and maybe, you know, if you just went to regular school and you don't question things very much and, and you know, you're sort of relying on your education to prepare, you're like, oh, okay, ranking, cool, good, uh, you know, number five college in the U.S., I'll go there, whatever. But if you start to unpack it, like this is an insanely complex system where money's flowing everywhere and it's like, you know, money flows obviously from the colleges to U.S. News because, you know, why wouldn't it? There's no regulation on that. It's a ranking by a, by a supposedly neutral third party, but of course there's no, like, oversight there, so obviously colleges have it in their interest to give money to U.S. News in order to up their ranking, and so, you know, and like high schools are ranked by this this body now too, and so like there's this whole fucked up thing about, you know, they do this calculation rating the high schools, and the high school ratings like leads into colleges, like colleges will look at the ranking, and if you like drill down into the U.S. News system and, and on this like forgotten page at the back of their website, is like, we generate these rankings by looking at the websites of these colleges. <laughs> and you're like, ah, people are making these huge $100,000 decisions where they're going to be in debt for their most of their adult lives based on this stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know. So I felt like my education kind of let me down in that regard, right? Because you, know, you sort of get fed these facts. Like in the example I gave was, um, you know, the periodic table, like what's the atomic weight of lead, right? Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly, well, neither did I, right? Um, but you could probably tell me, like, what, what's the best super effective counter for a dark type Pokemon or something? Yeah, I think so. Is yeah. Psychic? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, there you go. <laughs> right, and the whole crowd knew that answer, right? And so my point was that it's not it's as though the periodic table is more complex than understanding the re relationships of the Pokemon to one another. It's just that it hasn't been presented in an interesting way in a system that people want to interact with. And so I think you could make a really cool game-like thing that you would play instead of just memorizing the periodic table for that test that you had and then forgetting it the next day, right? And so that's what we were trying to do. So we made these, these two games. One was about water quality and earth sciences, and the other one was about uh, persuasive writing. And so you, like, make an avatar, and, and part of it was getting the kids invested in the world, and then you, like, go into this world, and there's, like, all these fish dying in this national park in this river, and you, you have to go around and, and test the water samples, and, like, we, we put a lot of energy into making this very accurate. So you get these water samples, and it'd be, like, the seven different parameters of water quality, like pH and all this sort of thing. And then you have, like, this little vir virtual fish tank simulation, and you kept having to kill the fish in particular ways to tease out what, what would kill them, like if you, if you added X amount of, um, you know, oxygenation versus like pH balance and temperature changes and so on. And you could see that, that like changing the pH had all these crazy subtle effects that rippled out through the system, and that system has integrity. Like it's actually kind of a simulation of the way things work, and it's a complex system like Civ or, or SimCity or Simant or something. I guess Simant's not that complex, but... Um, the idea was to put the kids in there and not pull any punches and not assume that kids are idiots and needed to be, you know, behaviorally modified. And I, I feel like the the necessary attitude you have to have if you want to succeed as a teacher in America is that how can I as quickly as possible download this data onto these kids like they're a bunch of thumb drives so that they can, you know, take a test and have that data pulled back off of them. Like how good is their accurate recall, which is just not a good preparation for choosing your health plan or, you know, trying to save the environment or buying a car or any number of the insanely complex systems that we have to interact with on a daily basis. So I, like, really wanted to do something with this game design knowledge that would improve the world in some meaningful way. So I, you know, and it was, it was very painful and it was really hard and it was, like, on top of the fact that nobody has any idea how to design a good game consistently, especially if they're designing a game that no one's made before, right? We're trying to also have this real world impact on kids lives where they now understand earth sciences and like water quality particularly in a much deeper level and, and at an intuitive level like you can recall the dark type Pokemon super effective counter right and it seems like we were relatively successful we, we, we were running this pilot program of these games I don't work there anymore because I, I sort of branched off to work at, on scale again but 
we're, there's this, this district called Sunnyside in Tucson, Arizona, which is like a poster child for an at-risk district. It's like 70% of the kids are on subsidized lunches. Most of them are English second language students. They speak Spanish mostly. Um, and so they, they just really don't have the type of future that a lot of us have as being, I was raised in California, Northern California, very affluent neighborhood. Of course I'm going to go to college. Like most of these kids are probably not going to go to college or whatever. Um, but so the whole community got together and raised their own taxes to get a $16 million bond. And with that money, they have outfitted every single kid in their entire district, like 2,500 kids or something, with laptops that are theirs to take home. And they have like really put a lot of money into infrastructure and they're bringing in like Valve and uh, the Center for Games and Impact and all these games and they're like trying to really reshape education and they're really open to this sort of thing. So anyway, we piloted this game and I have these wonderful essays written by these kids who their teachers say they don't write, like they, they just won't and they, they can't get them to focus on stuff and the school is just not working for them at all and they come in and they play our game and because we put so much energy into making the graphics look, you know, not amazing because there's only three artists working on it, but but good enough that it's not just like a flash game like they normally would see in the computer lab. And we put a lot of energy into, you know, making the system really complex, but then also like zooming back out and saying, okay, how do we make this usable and understandable? And we worked with people who are like the content experts in in the world at at earth sciences and water quality. Um, like these, like I got to hang out with like a Nobel laureate and talk to him about, you know, it's like this crazy experience. And so it seems to be working. Like they did this comparison study. This whole thing was funded by the Gates Foundation, by the way. That's the other background of this. But yeah, so it seemed like it really worked. And so it basically this would replace a, a big chunk of your earth sciences textbook. So instead of sitting and listening to a teacher talk linearly, you get into this rich world with all this consequentiality, like you're positioned as, an, as a water quality scientist going into the world, so all the characters in the world treat you that way, and you have to, you have to solve this problem, and it's, it's like a really complex problem that involves not only like the fish and the water quality, but it involves all these different stakeholders in the park. There's like a logging camp there, and then you know, there's like a fisherman resort, and then there's a, an organic farm, and you have to figure out like if any of these three are causing the fish to die because there's like leakage of the fertilizer from the organic farm but they're like all offended by it and there's like a budget for the park and all the stakeholders make a certain amount of money based on what you allow them to do or don't do because you get to regulate them so there's like this sort of uh, intricate like you get to apply regulations like Mr. Logger you are no longer allowed to log within 500 meters of the stream anyway you get the sense you get the sense of what I'm getting at but but then you know and, and we put all this energy into making the back end really cool for the teachers because one of the things that we identified was that teachers get really, you know, not bored, but they're just not interested and they, they're sort of disenfranchised and when they take the kids to the computer lab, it's like a chance for them to relax for an hour and play Facebook or whatever, play Facebook games. <laughs> so we tried to take and make an interface that showed all the kids going through the game and like letting them in interface with stuff. So in the, in the persuasive writing game, the teacher actually plays a character in the game and can kind of zip, zip in and out and, and um, you in that one you're uh, a newspaper reporter that's how you're positioned and you have to convince all the people in this town to either be for or against this doctor who's trying to come up with a cure and it turns out he's maybe experimenting on this human-like creature it's sort of a retelling of Frankenstein it's pretty that's dark awesome. I can't believe they let us get away with it but yeah it's really cool but anyway so the teacher plays as the editor of the newspaper and so you'll write a, an article and give it to Scoop the editor of the newspaper and then you'll get comments back and it, you, the good teachers will write as scoop and it's great for the teachers because it's not like Mrs. Smith is being a jerk to me it's like oh that scoop he's an asshole like he turned down my my uh, pay, my article again and I have to go back and revise it and so on so yeah anyway big big rant basically I think that there's a huge difference that can be made by game designers particularly in the future of education, I would encourage everybody who's good at game design to go like take a year and try to make a, a game like this. But make sure that you're making a game that's not supplemental, that's actually meant to be part of the curriculum. Because the supplemental stuff just doesn't happen because the teachers are already so overloaded with the crap they have to teach you the test. Standardized testing is the worst thing that's ever happened to education, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would uh, I'm not an expert on it, but it seems to me that anytime you drain anyone of a sense that what their individualism or their 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 personal learning style or just who they are as a human being anytime you start treating people like 
just a, a horde of uh, replaceable drones and then give them a score and that's what your worth is, they're usually asking for trouble at that yeah. point. Which is why they're so drawn to these games, I'd imagine, because yeah. so many people I've talked to who've played video games, I'm like, why did you play that video game for so long? Why did you try to get all those achievements? They're like, it felt important. Yeah. I go to work during the day and I'm just another guy, you know, it's sitting in a cubicle. But I come home and I, you know, got that achievement in Dead Rising. I felt like I did something unique and important. Yeah. And if you can teach people in that way to make them feel like they're doing something that's a representation of who they are, they're exploring uh, a world that they can have a unique relationship with that's got all these dynamics that you've infused into it and come out at the end of it feeling invigorated like they lived as opposed to like they were just put in a, a, a locker and had, like you said, someone try to stick a, a USB into their head yeah. to have them download things, but they, they weren't asked to experience anything. Of course they're going to think that sucks. Yeah, well, but but even on top of like the annoyingness of it, it's it's just not useful. Mm, like at, at, no, at no point in your adult life are you going to sit down and take a Scantron test and be paid like a hundred thousand dollars or you know not based on how well you do on the Scantron test. Like that's just not an, an analogy that works for real life. In the same way, one of these fascinating things that I found out from uh, like James Paul G. Uh, he, he wrote this book, like, What Video Games Can Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. He's sort of the foremost literacy scholar in the U.S., or in the world, I guess, really. Okay, him, I guess. Oops. He's an interesting fellow, but he, he's very much, he's very big in the academic circles. I, I hadn't actually read the book until we sort of kind of started working with him. <laughs> um, but he he was telling me that, like, the, the five-paragraph essay it just is not a thing. That It's just a completely made-up construct so that so that you can teach kids some sort of rigid structure and you can, as a teacher, you can grade 40 kids worth of essays so much faster if they're all formatted in the five paragraph essay but, but you know, it really misses the point of what writing is about, right? What would you rather have, a kid who can write a five paragraph essay or a kid who can like really write something passionate and persuasive? Like articles that you write for your, your website, you wouldn't write in a five paragraph essay format, you just try to write something that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and like that just gets lost. And the more standardized the test, the more standardized the method, the more humanity gets drained out of it, and more purpose gets drained out of it. So I don't know. I just feel like that's something that we can do with games. Like we did this thing. Okay, so we talked to a bunch of teachers, um, and the, and we were like, okay, persuasive writing. What's like the number one thing? What's the, what if you can teach this to kids? What is what makes the biggest difference in their lives going forward? Like from this point on, if they learn this, now all of a sudden they can write so much better. And it turns out, you know, we've all seen this diagram. It's like, here's your thesis, and you have these reasons that support the thesis, and then you have pieces of evidence. And if you can correctly link the evidence to the reason, that junction point right there was identified by all the teachers we talked to as the, the hardest thing to teach kids and the thing that makes the biggest difference. So we made this whole mini-game thing where you have these blocks of different things that you learn from the townspeople. You walk around and you get quotes from them. And then you have to like link those up to the reasons, and then you hit this button, and it like tells you how well you've linked things together. And we actually went through and did this like crazy Excel matrix of how many points you get when things are linked to other things, and so on. Um, and it turns out it like works pretty well, and it's such a like it seemed really simple to me, but it, I mean it's you know it seems to make a really big difference based on these essays that we get back from these kids, you know, because we they all go into this back end system, so we can sort of peruse and look through the essays and stuff. But there's some really amazing passionate, interested writing. And that, that was part of it, right? It's like trying to make the world feel like it had consequence that responds to you and, and your decisions really make a big difference. Because you can, it doesn't really matter what you do, like there's sort of this branching path where you have to decide either the doctor gets to continue his experiments and try to save the town from this plague that everyone's dying from, or you go the other way and you, you don't allow him to continue. And like at that branch point, it doesn't actually really matter what you do. There's going to be somebody who's really unhappy with you at the end. So either either you allow the doctor to continue, and then like the little blind girl who's friends with the monstrous creature who who behaves human but doesn't really speak, so it's kind of unclear if he's human. She's like crying over his corpse at the end of it, and then and all the people in the town are saying. But if you go the other way, then like half the people that you've interviewed are dead because the plague just rampaged through the town, and it's just like. You know, it's like, wow, I can't believe they let us get away with doing that because that's really brutal, but the kids get to the end of it and they're like, holy crap, there's no, 
simple answer, really. And it's like, yeah, this is a complex system, and this is kind of how the world works, right? Like, you can do stuff, and there's always going to be somebody who hates you for it. Like, it's just always going to happen. But you should still do stuff because, you know, you only get one life kind of thing. I don't know. Do you have any kids yet? No. Because can you be my dad? Yes. I want no, you to no, have no. brought me up. I'm faxing the paper with you right now. <laughs> You're a great dad for the future. Uh, I have a bunch of more things I want to talk about, but okay, I'm being sure. a jerk and ignoring the questions, and we only have, I don't know, it depends on how long Sinistar lets us go on for, but it might only be 25 to a half an hour uh, left. So anyway, the questions, questions from the viewers. Sirman asks, how does booking a spot on the E3 show floor look and how much do you think it actually helps, considering how much it costs? Uh, I don't like to pay for things because I don't have a lot of money. Because I, every time I take, every time I get a bunch of money, I just view that as like an interstitial step to game development. Kind of like when I was a kid, and when I saw money, it was just like a step between me and getting more games for my Nintendo. So, <laughs> so, so, so um, the answer is I didn't pay for that booth space. I I actually just submitted my game to Indicate, and they had this sort of in between the halls kind of space that they were allowed to set up in and I actually loved that because it was not I wasn't getting my face blasted off by giant gigawatt speaker systems all the time it was kind of chill but like a lot of people would come down there to chill and so people would come down there to chill and they'd play our games and we actually got to talk to them and it was really fun and nice um, I have a hard time understanding how much doing a, you know sub homes really contributes. I, I know it certainly is a lot better than not doing it. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to say until like I release the game and see if it's good and people have heard of it or not. But I kind of think that there's no such thing as an indie game that's overexposed. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. I, I think we're, we're a little myopic. We have this sort of echo chamber effect where people get upset that everyone talks about Meat Boy all the time, but there are still hundreds of thousands of people buying Meat Boy every year and you would think that, that that would be exhausted, that everyone who would ever have wanted to buy Meat Boy would have bought it by now, but that's totally not the case because there are just so many people in the world, and our little sphere of influence in our little world is just so small. And, like, everybody, we need to help each other as much as possible to promote all our stuff because I think our stuff is a lot cooler than a lot of other stuff, like weird free-to-play, you know, suck your money away, People spend a hundred thousand dollar on it, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's another just, whole rant. <laughs> <laughs> but it feels good to talk about stuff that you truly believe in, and yeah. I don't think we should feel like we're being um, selfish or jerks by doing that. And you're right. There's uh, it's amazing to me that we we feel like we've talked to everybody that we possibly can because it, it, it feels like a small world. But then suddenly someone will just break out. And I feel like I talk about Minecraft way too much, but I'm still just endlessly fascinated with the fact that this Absolutely. thing that just does not look like it should have succeeded, it, it defied all conventional oh, yeah. concepts of what people want. And little kids every day, I meet a new little kid. That sounded... Every day, no, no, no. I... Uh, <laughs> no, no, you only um, get into I, trouble if you say specific <laughs> age numbers. Like, I really love 11-year-olds. You can say I love kids, but you can't be specific. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but every day I hear about somebody, and sometimes it's not somebody younger than me, that just discovered Minecraft, and that's all they, they want now. And the, what they love about it is that it's uh, a world that what they do in it matters, and they feel like it's yeah. a real place where they can make some real effects happen and, and affect not only themselves, but the world and other people in there. And why not throw out all the textbooks and just make Minecrafts for everybody? Yeah, why yeah. Not? Maybe you should do that. Well, later. actually, that's one of the things that people are um, doing. Like, at Sunnyside, they're bringing Minecraft in as, as like, a in-school lesson. Like, there's, like, an educational version of Minecraft that Mojang has made that has particular tools for teachers to wrangle a classroom full of kids and have them all build things together and talk about architecture and stuff. I had no idea. Awesome. Absolutely. I was being and, facetious a little bit because I felt like you were already doing that, but then you technically actually were bringing Minecraft in there. Yeah, yeah. And Valve Valve has, like, a Steam educational version. So it's, Nobody ever talks about this. Oh. I know. It's crazy, man. And it's so cool and interesting. And they have, they have like their special educational version of Portal, which is Portal 2, which lets you teach physics. It's like a physics for kids lesson through Portal 2. 
Awesome. I will write about all of these things. Yeah, no, super interesting. Yeah, no, I haven't seen <laughs> any of that reported on. Uh, back to the questions, though. Dino Puncher asks... Good name. Yeah, it is. Very nice. Making a game with unlimited scaling or shadow physics opens up huge rabbit holes of possibility, but also danger of scope blowing up. Do you have to be extra careful about adding features to be sure you don't open up any additional rabbit holes and losing control of the project? Yeah, that, I'm worried... Hearing about what you went through with shadow physics, I can't help but just instinctually be worried that something similar happened with scale because it's yeah. just as wonderful of a premise, but it also seems like it's equally exploitable and difficult to kind of keep it contained and keep it uh, managed. So is that something you've been running into? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's something that I've thought a lot about, right? Because, you know, there were a lot of things wrong with the shadow physics project in general, but, yeah, I mean, scope creep was definitely a problem, but I, I think the reason why scope kept creeping in shadow physics was because it's like, okay, okay, shit, this isn't really cool or fun. Like, what else do we got? <laughs> mm, okay. whereas, with, whereas with scale, I feel like I have a bunch of stuff that I really am happy with already, and I, I feel content to continue exploring it, but I also feel very zen about just kind of at some point saying, you know what? This might be cool. In fact, I have a very strong instinct that it might be cool, but it's doesn't need to go in the game. It's we're done mm. for now. Huh. There was a wonderful talk by the FTL guys this year at, at GDC at the Independent Game Summit, and they basically did everything perfectly right. And their attitude about scope is amazing. And and like Justin was showing all these amazing artwork that he had done as as mock-ups and stuff with like intricate piping and you could see everything in the ship and so on. And then they were just like, Yeah, but way back when we were prototyping, we made this sort of bad assumption about the resolution of the game and what it, what it was going to be, and uh, yeah, we had this opportunity. We were like, yeah, I guess we could refactor it and do all this stuff, and they're like, no, it's not important. People don't care about the graphics, apparently. Like, they're good enough. People really like the game. And so, yeah, move on. Moving on, you know? Huh. And, and, like, their attitude is just so good. And I'm so just like... It's nice of you to say. Not everyone is so willing to... You're, you're, you're really... You're nice to people. You notice I, the good things about I people. I like nice. people a lot. And I really don't like it when people are nasty to each other. I like very much the... Did you read John Walker's piece on uh, Rock, Paper, Shotgun yesterday? Oh, sure. On the, the more recent one about misogyny. About, about just the... Yeah, we're not going to tolerate this shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I feel, right? Like, you know, people just wouldn't say stuff like that in my presence because I... I have no hesitation getting up in your face about that, but I love that you are also fighting that fight, and I know you know everybody who does takes a bit of flack for it, but I think it's really awesome because I think that you should look at humans first and then the gender thing after that, I guess, maybe, because it's not really important because people are people and you should just get to know them, and if you lack the basic human empathy to understand why the shitty things that you're saying might upset people and why that might be bad, like... I think maybe you should just not not talk to people anymore on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that's uh, that's tempting to talk more about. Uh, but we're that's going to be a total out of control spin. <laughs> <laughs> Angelou said something really nice recently that made me happy. Uh, I can't remember what it was though. Of course, it it had to do with because I get annoyed with the internet, and she was talking about tolerance and how people. You know, don't look at people and say, think the way I think you should think. Instead yeah. of lo look at the tools they have and what they do with them and try yeah. to help them build better tools. So I'm, I do my best not to just yell at, at yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. But they, they are kind of frustrating sometimes. Well, to say the least. It's, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the black and white, you know, I ordered tidy simplicity of their world that they've sort of been fed by their schooling and stuff. I think if they look at things more openly with an idea that the world is full of crazy complex systems, then maybe they'll be a little bit more open to these ideas that there are other people out there in the world. I mean, I, I had a very interesting experience in high school because I was actually a minority. I went to a high school in, in uh, Cupertino, California called Limbrook, which is a very highly ranked academic institution. There are people who send their kids from Taiwan and like spoof addresses so that their kids can go to this school because it's supposed to be really good for getting into college and so on. But it was uh, 72, 73% uh, minority, minority, except I know from going there that it's Chinese people and Indian people, uh -huh. right, which are the two most populous nations on earth. Yeah. 
So labeling that, putting those two into a group to begin with, and then labeling that whole group minority, it means that, that Limbrook gets a, a special billing in U.S. World News like high school ranking because they have like 4% people at the school who are on subsidized lunches, but 70% minorities. So they're basically, they, it really skews their results because they have such high test results. And it's just, they're just like this perfect factory for appearing like an amazing academic institution that's mostly minority, but nobody there is, you know, everyone's very affluent. It's like programmers whose parents work at Google, you know, whatever. Sure, but it's minority it, it, it without really the class fast, yeah. usually. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know. It just makes no sense to me when, when people get so upset about like people saying that there might possibly could be different pe people making video games or something. <laughs> Like, really? And that, you, you, you know, I've screwed up. I have had the best of intentions, but ended up delivering a message that a lot of people took as offensive, insensitive, hurtful, or made me look like I was a disgusting jerk. And when I'm like, I'm not a jerk, but I can then step away and look at what I made and be like, oh, I can see how people would, would see, see it that way. So regardless of what I intended, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, and then you try to move on from that. You, you may be a wonderful young man, and you just want to look at boob physics for a long time, and you don't want to hurt anybody. You just want to see boobs bounce up and down. Yeah. But if you go around and say that's what every game should be, you're going to end up hurting people, even if you don't mean to. And yeah. you're not a evil... Like you said, it's not necessarily black and white. You don't have to think, now I'm the villain of my story. You can still be the good yeah. guy of your story who needs to make some changes in order to get to the, the end uh, where everybody wins. Didn't well, Bruce Willis have to do that in Die Hard? Yeah, he probably. He didn't get to just do whatever he wanted. He had to like walk on glass and stuff. And get yeah, no, it, it was tough, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough being a cop. <laughs> you have to walk that line, and the line is covered with glass. Yeah, we, uh, people should look up to that a little bit more and be willing to... Just admit when nothing's uh, when they're not exactly perfect. Our Xanadu asks, "What do you think of the cavalcade of indie games coming out that can run on machines that came out even four years ago?" The way oh, that man. Uh, it's a wonderful interrogation and sort of destruction of the idea that in order for a game to be popular, it has to be cutting edge graphics, cutting edge hardware, like Minecraft and FTL and even Antichamber, like all these games prove that that's not actually what people give a shit about, really. Like, there are some people who give a shit about that, and I certainly think it's really cool to go into a world and have really crazy detailed graphics, and it's fun to, like, feel how different that feels now that you're walking around this world with all this crazy simulation going on, all this neat stuff. Um, and that's, like, a different kind of game that can be made. But, but man, you know, you look at FTL, it's, like, pretty crude graphics, right? It's, like, as good as they need to be and no better, and that was their whole attitude, and I think that is amazing. And it basically... It really undercuts the prevailing wisdom of the console makers and like you know the, the the history of video games in a lot of ways, which is really cool and really neat to see. Like it just doesn't matter that much, and and people are hungry for these experiences that are not that. So FTL in particular is fascinating to me because it's not as though people haven't been making Starship Simulator bridge games for years, and they just like hit it just right. And and that was just what people wanted, and they, you know, they, it's like that famous Alan Moore quote, right? It's like, you know, if if the audience knew what they wanted, they wouldn't be the audience; they'd be the artists, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I just really heartening to see that people are really starting to understand and embrace this idea that they there are experiences out there that don't rely on graphics that aren't, you know, it's not that important to them. I don't know. Yeah, I it's, it's, cool. it's by the same cool. token, I'm trying really hard to make my game look awesome, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the art direction you already have, but I, I'd read that you weren't necessarily satisfied with that, that that was placeholder. I emailed you a screenshot. Huh? I emailed you a screenshot of the new art treatment if you want to see oh, it. Oh, I didn't see it yet. Sorry. Dang it. I'll post <laughs> it when we do the rerun of the show. I'll sure. make sure that that's shown. Well, that's pretty exciting. So, uh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. We don't have that much time left. I'll do this question, and then okay. when I get back to that, I want to talk to you about art direction... I wanted to talk about the definition of experimental game. Oh, That's yeah. That's a big one. Oh, I wanted to talk to you about whether you think of Bioshock Infinite as experimental and if you have any thoughts about it. And then I also wanted to... Uh, uh, ugh, there's a lot of stuff I wanted to talk about. Hopefully, we'll get to We're not actually talking about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Sinistar. It happens when I get to sleep. <laughs> but I'm going to do a question first. Uh, okay. Dev class of 2012 rocks asks... Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk more about the newish art style of scale we've seen? Oh, perfect. Thank you, Dev Class of 2012 Rocks. I remember seeing it a while ago, and it looks a lot better now. So talk to us about what you've been doing with scale and the art direction. So I had this kind of retro art style that I had thrown in there that was basically like simple 3D geometry with pixel art painted textures slapped on there. And what I had done is I'd gone in and in the texture settings, I just turned off all compression and all resampling. So that as you would scale an object up, the texture would remain exactly the same. It would just get bigger and bigger. So it was almost like vectorized pixel texture kind of thing. Because the problem with making a game where you can scale objects up and down as much as you want is that texel density starts to be variable. There's this thing called texel density that 3D artists worry about in 3D games where it basically means uh, how much resolution is going to be on the texture relative to the size of the object and the position of that object relative to the camera. So basically, you don't want to have like somebody's thumbnail having a 1024 by 1024 texture with normal map and, and spec map on it because no one is ever going to see that thumbnail unless their thumbnail is like the thumbnail of destiny and it's going to like come way up to the camera and so on. So, so the problem is uh, in a game where you can make anything like a tree or a chair or a bug or a whatever as large as the world basically there's a sort of you need sort of an infinite amount of detail and I was you know thinking about how to do this because the textures will get blurry and shitty looking if you make them too big uh, so then I just decided like fuck it let's just take out all the textures uh, and so now it's sort of this like all the detail is embedded in the geometry because modern graphics cards even like your MacBook Air or whatever like shitty integrated graphics cards can push a ton of polygons now like millions of polygons because they've been thinking about how to push more polygons for so very long. Um, so basically, if you have like a tree, it, uh, I just put all the detail on the tree and the 3D geometry of the tree, and it has no textures, and so you scale it up, and there's just more and more detail there. And I really want this to be a game where you can like scale up a rock wall, and then like you can go into the cracks in the wall, and like there's stuff in there or not or whatever, you know. But that's the kind of thing I want to play with. Well, that sounds awesome. So you've gone with the fact that where we're at with polygons right now is the strength of the technology of even the cheaper technology and utilize that to push your idea that um, something really small could be feel very different though be identical uh, technically to what it was uh, before if you blow it up really big. Yeah, oh, exactly. Fun. When's it going to be done? Uh, never. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I... I'm really thinking hard about what to do with it because I'm going to run out of money in like a year or so, so I may do a, a Kickstarter, but I kind of feel like it's not a great game for a crowdfunding thing, whereas FTL is like a pretty great game for crowdfunding because every time you play it, it's different and it's about randomization and it's about systems tuning and stuff, whereas Scale is much more like a tailored experience, even if I am going to really free things up a little bit and make it more like Mario 64 where you like go into a world and you, you're given a thing you can do, but you could also just wander off and go find other things and try to find other stars or, or interactions or interesting stuff in this other part of the world. It's much more like once the idea is in your brain and you've understood it, it's kind of gone and spoiled, right? That's, that's one of the, the hardest things about making a game that has puzzles, which is that a puzzle before you've solved it is infinitely difficult, and a puzzle after you've solved it is infinitely easy. Mm -hmm. And so it's like it just trips over that point, right? So, yeah. It, I feel like oh. it's maybe not that great because because then what am I going to do? Like, I would love to, if I have a Kickstarter or something, I'm gonna, I want to give the backers the game. So I'm playing with the idea of maybe doing, like, a like physics gardens. So, you know, here's the physics garden, and here's all the object types and all the stuff that I'm playing around with. Go play and have fun and imagine what the puzzles might be. And that might be an interesting way to interact with the community and, and just, like, find more cool stuff that I haven't found in the systems. And also, it helped me, you know, figure out how to fix problems and broken things without spoiling all the content, maybe. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I just, uh, I... <laughs> for, for me, if I like being in a place in a game, I will redo the same puzzle. Um, it's nice if there's some variation to it, of course, but... If I just want to be there and do the things, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've just rolled over those same children in Katamari. Yeah. Oh, you love Katamari. Or just done the roses thing. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I love those roses. I don't know if you remember the, uh, the sequel yeah. of Katamari at the end. You can just roll up. I think it's a million. Um, never quite got there. But, but I, I have the sense that scale will be that kind of game, that you can just play it to be there and 
uh, use the mechanics to feel what they do, even if it's only slight variations every time on, on what happens, that'll be enough. Uh, that's my feeling, anyway. I, I mean, I hope so. I mean, okay, so here's here's an example of, a, of an interaction. I, I, I love to even call it a puzzle, because no one finds it challenging. They just find it interesting. But so here's here's something I have in the game right now. So you, like, walk through this environment, and you find this little tiny house. And you use the scale gun to blow the house up so that it's large enough that you can go inside it. And there's all these rooms and all this stuff in there. And you walk through, and in, in the back bedroom, there's a bed and a dresser. And on the dresser is another tiny house. And so then you can pick up that tiny house, take it outside of the house that you're in, put it down, scale it up so it's large enough to go in, and then walk all the way up into the back of that house, and then there's like a trigger plate there. And there are no other objects in the environment you can pick up, and so the solution is to go back outside to the first giant house, scale it down till it's tiny, pick it up, and take it back into the position in the back bedroom of the smaller house that was in the house to begin with and put it there to unlock the level. Yeah, that's something I would just like to do every once in a while. <laughs> right. Even it's if I know what's going to happen that way, it would still feel... I mean, it, it comes back to the idea of spoilers, which has yeah. been on the internet a lot because of Bioshock Infinite and other things. Uh, I'm the kind of person that even if I know something's coming, if it's saying an idea that resonates with me and it, it feels good to, to be there with it, you know, I'll play Mega Man 2 every couple of months, just play through the whole thing nice. in a half hour and just be happy to be there again. Of course, it's not like the first time, but in a way, it's more. In a way, it's like a comforting old friend now, as opposed to. Yeah. And uh, scale good. could end up the same way. I hope so. <laughs> I I mean I, I hope so too. Like it's always hard to say, right? Games yeah. are so hard to make, and like sometimes you sit down and just like everything you do is awesome, and then sometimes you sit down and it's just like pulling teeth to get yeah. a single feature online, and it's like really hard to predict which way it's going to go. But you, I feel like you just kind of got to sit down. Not worry about it. Put in your hours and 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 trust that like awesome stuff is gonna fall out of it. <sighs> uh, ugh, it sounds so hard. Yeah. I'm so glad you're doing it for us, <laughs> making the thing. How much time do we have left? A little bit. Uh, do you want to talk about what you define as experimental game and where that line is? Sure. Uh, because it's something. It's pretty. I guess it's pretty subjective, but to me, it feels like a hard and fast line where the the intentions of the developer are, but how am I supposed to assess that playing it? So, so how do you go about assessing that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like there was this definition of experimental games that was kind of very popularized by Braid and the experimental gameplay sessions. And I think it still exists, but I think it's starting to get a lot more broad. But I think it's basically if you try to take a mechanic and express all these sorts of deep, interesting possibilities that no one really thought about before, through exploration of that particular mechanic. And I think there's this idea that it has to be a puzzle game, which I think is actually kind of wrong-headed. I, I don't know. I'm kind of, like, off definitions or, like, wanting to define things, except in the capacity that it makes it better, makes me better at making games, like, by at least going through the exercise of trying to define stuff. Because, um, like, I, I wrote that book, right? And... Uh, you wrote a book? Yeah, yeah. It's called... I game... have not done my research very well. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Please. Uh, it's called Game Feel, A Game Designer's Guide to Virtual Sensation. You can get it on Amazon. It's kind of expensive, though, because they sell it as a textbook. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it was an unbelievable, mind-melting amount of work. But I spent a lot of time in the book like, trying to come up with definitions, right? Okay, what is the definition of game feel? And, like, you know, break it all down. And it was a really useful exercise, but now I kind of feel like, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, you have to assemble these elements of a game, and even if you're borrowing elements from other games the way that you put them together is really what's important more than what those elements are. I think there's a tendency amongst players to look at a game like Cube or something, for example, and say, oh, it's a Portal clone, a ripoff. And the, that, that is almost always the feedback that you get. Like, like when, I, when those videos of scale from E3 went wide, everybody on like IGN and Kotaku or Destructor or whatever was posting like, oh, it's Minecraft meets Portal. And, I, and I'm like, mm, that's not... Really? I don't, <laughs> that okay. didn't occur to me, but I do yeah. think we live, uh, we talked about it before uh, in general, how people have the kind of my perspective is what counts, share my perspective attitude, especially on the internet. Um, yeah. Maybe it's true of other fields, but I see it in video games a lot, where people will just say, oh, that made me feel Minecraft and Portal feels, therefore that's what that is. 
I actually think that would be a more valid way to categorize games, but I mean, I don't think my game gives you Minecraft and Portal feels. And maybe it gives you a little bit of Portal feels, but certainly not Minecraft feels. It doesn't give me any of those feels, but yeah. if you only look at the, oh, it's a game where I'm not shooting a guy and I thought about something, and oh, that has got uh, low-res textures on, uh, oh, okay, feels there, therefore that's what that is. Yeah. I really hope that we as a culture get away from saying, oh, I have to tell you exactly how I see everything and start asking each other, oh, well, what do you see and how do you see it? Maybe I can see it that way. Yeah. It's just a lot more fun. That's, uh, that's what I like about video games. I feel yeah. like I get to get in your brain because <laughs> of the thing you made, not I don't get to go out there and, you know, it's not if I just was me in every video game I played and it was all about my perspective. I'd be bored out of my skull. I'm so bored of me. <laughs> but I get to be in your brain for a while when I play scale, which is what I want. Hmm. Oh, yeah. a question happened. Oh, uh, no. Star lets us keep doing the show because sure. I haven't even asked you about Bioshock Infinite, which I'm just asking everybody about it for oh, a okay. reason. Oh, rats. Okay, maybe we can do them both. Swagger Dragon asks... How would you? Uh, how would one get into games for education? Are those largely independent, or are there bigger developers looking into this? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so so a lot of the problems that are that need to be solved are like not game design problems. Like there are plenty of game design problems that need to be solved because it's hard enough to make a good game, and it's really hard to make a game about a subject that is then supposed to transform someone's actual behavior in real life. Like, that's not a thing that oftentimes people try to do except to get them to give you more money. Like, that's the only behavior that people does. Um, people do in games. But, yeah, basically get in touch with a university that's trying to put something together or, you know, the Gates Foundation or, I mean, it, there's no, like, model for how to do it because no one's really been successful. Because a lot of the problems are the stuff I was talking about earlier with how the teachers are trapped in this complex system where they have to teach to the test and like the youngest, most enthusiastic teachers are always the first ones that get laid off when the budget cuts come and the budgets are tied into the schools which like get and lose money based on the academic performance on the tests and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so actually the biggest problem that needs to be solved is kind of like a marketing, positioning, getting the games into schools proving their effectiveness. Um, one of the most interesting conversations I had when I was working on those games was with the testing company. And they were, they were saying, man, we really hate it that the day our test comes to the school is the worst day of those kids' lives. Like, they hate us so much. How can we help that? And we had this whole great conversation about how we can make our game and the metrics that it collects, like on our teacher-facing side, how we can turn that into testable data. So the kids could just play the game instead of having to take the bubbled Scantron, and like that was wow. I mean, that's a, that would be a radical paradigm shift, right? Like that would be amazing. That's the kind of thing that actually needs to get solved. But I mean, getting getting into it basically just find someone who's doing it and try to get on board. I I, I mean, a friend of mine made like an iPhone game called Cash Cow. Um, Sounds good. It, it, it's basically a puzzle. It's like a sort of sorter puzzle game, kind of like Bejeweled, but you, you make change. That's what you do in the game. Huh. So it's just like you keep making change, and they ha had a ton of classrooms buy it because they wanted to teach little kids how to make change. Like that's one of the typical things that you do when you first start learning math or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like make change for 25 cents, make change for a dollar. Like how many different ways can you do it kind of thing. And like So there's really no barrier to doing it. It's just a question of getting it in there, getting it in front of people, I think it's my experience was that you really want to work with an academic. I think uh, as game designers, we have a little bit of swagger that maybe we don't deserve to have about when we start when we talk to educators, like because because all teachers wish that their kids were as engaged in what they were saying as they are in Pokemon or their games or whatever. So as as game designers, it's kind of like yeah, we got the kids, man. Let's talk about it. But really, teachers have been doing this way longer than us, and they thought way harder about it. And it's you know. They, they have a ton to teach us about how to teach people because mm -hmm. games, you know, you come up with these complex systems and these ideas, but then you still have to teach it to people really efficiently in a way that doesn't bore them. That's, that's yeah. interesting to them or whatever. So I don't know. I, I think it's really important to get in touch with real academics who are really doing research in, in a field and, and try to understand deeply what they care about. Like I was telling you with the teachers, figuring out what, what it was about persuasive writing that's the hardest thing to teach and, and is the most useful if you can get it across kind of thing. 
And that's where you should start. And you shouldn't make somebody else's game that's already been made and then try to shoehorn content into it because that's how we end up with these little educational games that have this terrible reputation. So I did want to play po uh, Pokemon with the periodic table, though. <laughs> I would totally play that. But, uh, but you're right, doing something that's new, that feels new, that doesn't, that has integrity. It's not like make a, it made a big difference with the kids. They felt that integrity. Yeah. They took to it more because of that. So being humble, going into it with fresh ideas, listening to what actual teachers think. And I presume you had to go up against a lot of kind of this hard, fixed notion we have, in this culture anyway, that if it's fun, that it's not productive. And if it's painful and boring, that it must be work, and therefore work is, is good. Yeah, uh, so you should be bored and sad. Yeah, um, that's. I mean, that's such a pernicious influence on the way that we educate people, because I, I think the most efficient way to educate people is to let them play. Like in in American schools, failure is the worst thing that you can do. It's you know, failing is the worst thing that can happen to you. But if if you really want kids to learn about like water quality, earth sciences, position them as a water quality specialist, turn them loose in a national park in a way that they never could in real life. And let them make the big calls, and let you know the park close down because it's run out of money, and and the loggers you kick them out, but but now you don't have the money that you get from them paying their rent, and all the fish still died, and you're like, what the hell happened? Like, let them fail, and then mm -hmm. you know set the expectation that failure is a good thing because it's part of the process of learning. Man, the, the guests I've had on the show, you included, of course, have been coming up with the best T-shirt design ideas. <laughs> Last week we had um, uh, Paul Greasley, so he lives in New Zealand, and he said at one point, I asked him, why'd you get into game development? He said, uh, it was like better get, than being drunk and being a stooge. <laughs> and he said, game development, better than being drunk and being a stooge. And you, uh, a t-shirt, game design, let them fail. Yeah. Awesome. I'd wear that shirt how, every day. Kyle Gabler has that great quote about how uh, video game creation is like the, the new form of expression for motivated misfits or whatever it was. He had that great quote. That is great. Yeah. Ah, oh, I like people. They're great. Yeah. I guess we have to end the show. I didn't get okay. to ask you about Bioshock Infinite. If you have any comments on it, I haven't free. played it yet. I've basically been doing nothing but getting my game ready for GDC, then doing GDC, and now I'm in full GDC recovery mode. I actually just shaved. I've been going feral since GDC. <laughs> oh, yeah, you look nice. I just shaved, too. I had, uh, we did an episode of the show called The Question. Uh, where we asked people at Bio, about Bioshock Infinite, and I shaved for that, actually. Uh, well, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that someday. Okay. And in the sure. meantime, they should follow you on Twitter. It's at Steve Swink mm -hmm. on Twitter. And your website, which I think you still maintain, yeah. steveswink.com? I, I need to be a better blogger. I'm, I've been a bad boy lately. You've done plenty of stuff, Steve Swink. <laughs> you don't have to feel bad about that. You're, you're putting out all the junk, and you're being I'm on sure. my show. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, uh, as for I really, me, I love your show. I, I mean that genuinely. That was not a that was not a you know disingenuous compliment. It's definitely my favorite interview show. You you have a really good, chill conversational style. You make me feel like, man, this guy really cares about stuff, and it's awesome. And he's like really good at getting people to talk about interesting stuff. Not me, of course. I just ramble, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice of you to say. I, I only see my fail failings and failures. It's the, oh, the way. High five! I totally do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that makes you feel better. Yeah, I'm always just like, oh, I stumbled too much, and I shouldn't have talked over him, and I should have asked a better question. Blah blah blah. But I'm I'm still just gonna keep trying. Hopefully, uh, I'll be happy with myself someday. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's how we all are. But anyway, achieve I'm happily, a, man. You should achieve, achieve happily. Not don't have to. You don't have to achieve to be happy. Reverse that equation. Just be happy, and then just let the rest of it take care of yourself. You know. Thanks, Steve Swink. I did a you're, long you're stare. Awesome, just taking you're, you're it really good Dar. Thanks. <laughs> uh, anyway, wrapping up. I'm on Twitter at mm -hmm. Tron Knots. You can watch this show reruns on Destructoid TV, Detoid TV. Uh, on YouTube, and uh, and it's on iTunes. You can listen to reruns on iTunes, sub homes. And I guess that's it. Ugh. Thanks so much, Steve. Take care. Take it Bye -bye. easy, man. Good to meet you.